there. So, uh, as Bianca said, she went out there for three weeks while I stayed back here and held down the homestead and was with our son and you know, milking the goats and doing all the things that we do up at our village while she was away. But after a couple weeks, she called out for us and she said, listen, I think it's, it's safe, you know, there's, there's action going on in the front lines, but we actually, we could really use your help. She said, it's, it reminds me of what you told me it was like after Hurricane Katrina down in Biloxi, where they were building these communities in the wake of this disaster. But now, the disaster is an economic disaster. It's an environmental disaster. And the communities that are being formed, they, they have so many resources, they're being overwhelmed by them. Stuff is coming in from all directions, and it's just being unloaded into the mud. And the, the locals, the natives that are coming out here are so focused on going out to the front lines and standing in the way of this black snake, they don't always have time to sort through all of these resources that are piling up, literally, you know, as they're being unloaded. And so, myself, you know, having spent three years doing disaster relief after the, the tsunami in Asia, I went out to Thailand for three months, and then as soon as I got back from that, Hurricane Katrina happened, and I went out there for a whole year. And after that, I went to Peru, down to South America, and they had a 9.0 earthquake. And one thing that I found out in the course of doing all this disaster relief work, I didn't have any particular skills or background as far as you know, rescue or, or any type of um, experience that would make me think that I'm like some sort of superhero or just going to go in and, and help people out and save the day. But what I did was I came in and I did what she just said. I listened. I observed. I, I held space. I waited until I saw what really needed to get done, what wasn't going to get done, unless I did it. And so I would go and I would sit in the director for the entire emergency operations center for the Gulf Coast down in Mississippi. And I would just sit in his office for sometimes 45 minutes, just keeping my mouth shut, letting him take care of business. And then finally, after he wrapped up all the stuff he could do, he would look at me and say, well, what are you here for? And I would say, well, I want to know what's the thing that you wish you could do? What's the thing that's eating you up inside that you think that, oh, if only all this red tape wasn't holding you back that you would do? Tell me what that is, and I'll make sure that legions of volunteers handle that. And so, when I went up to, to Standing Rock to help out my wife, I didn't go up with any agenda other than to bring my son and to hold space for her, because I knew she had spent two weeks already building my relation and listening to the elders and listening to the youth and just setting the table for what was to come. And so when I showed up, I was, I was blown away by how, how, Many tribes gathered there. I mean, you see the flags as you're driving in. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tribes. Many of which, like she said, have never seen each other or have been at war fighting over resources for millennia. And yet they have all come together in solidarity to represent not just opposition to this black snake, to this pipeline, but protection for the water and holding space for a new era of civilization. Because right now, we are at the precipice of the economic insolvency of that old way of being. Because we can't just write off all these externalities. We can't just pretend like there's this away somewhere where we can send all of our waste, where we can just extract all the resources and pretend like it doesn't impact somebody. Now we're seeing firsthand who it impacts. And it's us. It's our people. It's the indigenous people. And it's the people that just that care about the land that's beneath their feet, about the air that they're breathing, and about the water that they're drinking. And so when we showed up, we listened. And we looked, and we said, what do people need? Oh, they need showers. We brought a shower out from Burning Man, <laughs> set it up, and built it. And you know, by the time we were leaving, people are in there getting hot water showers, which they hadn't had in weeks, because they didn't have time to set them up. You know, we go to the school and they've got all these resources. You know, there's no shortage of resources for them. You know, they didn't have shelves. <laughs> so we went up and we bought shelves. And flooring. We put floors down for the kids so they're not sitting in the mud. Same for the kitchens, you know. They had resources, boxes, cardboard boxes sitting in the mud. And so we just, all we did really was recognize that they had so much on their plate. They just needed a little bit of, of support. 
And that's, that's really all we provide. I mean, the, the locals, there's some amazing articles out there about how to go, and if you do go to Standing Rock, how to be in right relation while you're there. And one of the biggest things is trusting in native competence. Because they work differently than we're expected to. You know, these aren't Wharton graduates. These aren't people that have, that have, that have experienced the kind of things in the, in the civilization that we come from. But they represent a civilization that is very, very ancient and very, very competent. And so I just welcome anybody that goes out there to put aside your own agenda and just be in service and recognize that whether you're going out there to stand on the front lines and to get arrested and to testify and, and, and you know, speak truth to power, or if you're going there to support the medics or to support the kitchens or to support the schools that are there. That's all very worthy, but it's very important that you know, as, a, as an outsider, you recognize that you are there just to support. And so uh, I welcome all of you to support in whatever way you can, whether it's here at home or if you, if you decide to make the trek out there. One of the big callings right now, and it's something that we as Californians don't really, really don't understand the magnitude of, is that if we are going there, you have to be prepared for sub-zero weather. That means that the most expensive suit that we could buy at REI is not going to work. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm really serious. Um, literally, if, if you are planning on going out there, you want to do a lot of research on what type of materials. And literally, I mean, they have it down to a science where they'll say, first I'm going to put these ones on, and then come in day, those are going to get wet, so I'm going to remove this other top layer, and then I'm going to put these ones on, and then at night time I need to go and put these ones on. It's like that much, you know, understand. They, they understand that. And there is a concern that a lot of people going up there are not prepared. And we're talking hyperthermia, we're talking that. You know, and that, and that becomes a, a weight, which you know, my sister will be talking about that more. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, um, yeah. <coughs> So one of, one of the most potent ways that if you're really passionate about this, um, we're very fortunate in that we live in a time where we actually have the resources to move past what the demand that creates this black snake. You know, this pipeline that's being pushed through is to try and, and force our hand to have to stay hitched to this fossil fuel economy. But we live in a time when there's, it's, it's not like you have to go and buy a single electric car. There's, there's dozens of electric cars out there these days. There's thousands, maybe even millions of solar and wind companies out there. There's amazing revolutions happening in battery technology. We can, if we use our dollars, if we use our, our, our resources at hand, start moving past this, this fossil fuel economy that's, that's forcing these communities to experience these these really tragic, uh, it's almost environmental apartheid that's going on right now. And so, if you really are passionate about that, we need to stop buying cheap plastic crap from halfway across the world and start buying stuff from local artisans. We need to start putting our mind and our money and our hearts and our mouths together in unison around changing the narrative and saying it's not just about you know, it's not just about supporting this old way of being. And so I invite you, even if you say, I, I don't have the time to go out, I don't even have necessarily the resources to give, but you do, you can make that choice every single day. And it's by, by saying, no, this is, this is a new world, this is 2016, this is the 21st century, and we, we can be better than that. We don't have to support this industry that's causing these horrible things to happen. You know, when I, when I look at the news and I see what's going on, it's like the civil rights movement all over again. You know, and it's, it is, it, but it's an environmental civil rights, it's an indigenous civil rights movement. And so we are all part of that here in solidarity, but it's more than just Facebook likes and giving at the office. It's about changing our habits and our patterns. Yes. And we can all do that here today. And it's hard, I drive a car too, I commute, you know, but. I'm, I'm going to be committing just like everybody that, I, that, that that's in my family to, to changing our patterns as well. 
taking my car away. Coming home to coming home from Seattle, Rock, I was uh, yeah, I had a few conversations with my brother back there, Adam Rutter, yeah. And um, and I was really take what I knew needed to happen in coming home. Like I came home and it was just like, what's next? And then I looked around in our community, and I was like, oh, brilliance. I just like, yeah, I love people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what was important was, um, while I was there, I found, or I found camps that, that did not have financial sponsorship. Um, meaning, there are some camps whose reservations are sponsoring them to be there. Um, there are some camps that don't. There are camps that don't have any GoFundMe pages, that don't have tech, they're not technologically, you know, in it, in social media. They're in social media, but, you know, and so they had limited resources. Build relations with them. Establish, you know, PO boxes, and, you know, now we're establishing a residency address. And I'm able to correspond with them. And so one of the projects that we're working on um, with the San Diego Council is seeing that you know, there, there is requests for much larger ticket items like housing, like wind, wind power. And these are things that, you know, any GoFundMe of like getting there is not going to cut it. And so what we are doing here in San Diego is we're bringing all of our resources together. We have people that are on the ground now that are going, going to be on the ground this weekend, that are going to be on the ground two weeks from now. And we are allocating all of the resources that we can pull together here and we're getting those big ticket items that are so imperative to their survival over the winter. And I'm telling you, some of the people that are here in you know, this county or in our region, my gosh, yes, absolutely yes. And so I do ask, you know, if you have questions about that, but I'll just, you know, speak to my relatives back there. Um, and I think I'm feeling very complete at this moment. With two minutes to spare. <laughs> and we're going to have a panel at the end, so if you guys have any questions for this.